Hi, thank you Hi. for talking with us today. <laughs> Absolutely. Could you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, my name is Kellen Correa, and I'm the executive director and president of Friends of the Hunley. So I've been here about 14 years. And what is the Friends of the Hunley? Friends of the Hunley is uh, the worker bee of the project, basically. We do all of the, uh, it's a nonprofit organization, so we raise all the funds. Uh, we do all the press releases, the tours, basically all the non-science stuff is okay. what we're in charge of. And before we get to the raising of the Hunley, could you just tell us the history of the Hunley for people who why don't know? Why are we here? Like, why, why are you here? Like, why are we here? <laughs> why is this here? Uh, the Hunley submarine was not the first submarine ever, but it was the first successful combat submarine in history. Okay. So it goes, submarine warfare started right here. Right here. With the Hunley. Not well, this, this is, actual, but. <laughs> yeah, this is a replica. This is a replica, which is much larger, as then, you saw, than the actual, than the actual yes. submarine. Uh, Hunley's claim to fame is uh, she took down the USS Housatonic on February 17th, 1864 in the okay. Civil War. Uh, at that point in time in Charleston, the blockade had come in and it was really strangling uh, the port of Charleston and therefore the South for the most part. So the, the word submarine didn't exist back then. Um, it was called the fish boat, okay. among other not very positive names because <laughs> it had sunk twice. So it had a, it had a bad reputation. Um, but you could tell that basically shows the desperation of, of the Confederates in the South at that time to continue with this with this vessel. I mean, they invented this. So it's innovation. Okay. And, and you said this sunk twice mm -hmm. before it actually sunk the third sunk time. The third time. And, and, but it, it also accomplished its mission. So um, it did sink two previous times. The first crew, three actually got out, and all eight died in the second crew, including Horace Hunley, who the sub is actually named after. And a few months later, they did the final mission, which is when they accomplished by sinking the Housatonic, but it also didn't return didn't that return. night either, right. And, and that kind of speaks to either bravery or a little bit of insanity to have... And maybe both. Maybe both have watched it sunk two times. Mm -hmm. I think after the first time, I might be worried about getting back into it. But then having it sunk the second time and still it went, people went back in and did and it again. again. It, it, I believe that really shows the, the desperation that that they were feeling at that time, that they were willing, they knew it sank twice. Um, and, they, and it was very graphic uh, because the bodies, they drowned, they bloated. So unfortunately they had to be dismembered to get them out. Oh man. Right, so again, you've got that visual going through. Yeah. So I, I think that really gives a true testament of, of the desperation of, of that time. Wow. So this sank after it sank the Housatonic. Correct. Where does its story take it from there? Uh, it took forever to find it. Um, the big mystery of the Henry, Henley, you'll see that all, all around here, um, the mystery of why it sank, what happened to the men, and the answer is we don't know. Uh, we hope to find that out, or at least have good options for that. Um, people from the South were looking for the, for the Henley. People from the North were looking for the Henley. Um, just never never heard from again. Right when, uh, from the time it sank? After it sank, not right then, but also you got to think of the, you know, the war is still going on. It didn't yeah. end until 19, or 1865. And um, the the ship was so large as that, that when it sank, the masts were still sticking out. Okay. So they actually had to blow up the Housatonic wow. to free up the channels. Um, and the Hunley was also found, I think it's probably why it took so long for people to find it, is they assumed that, like, if here's the Housatonic site, and this is the Isle of Palms, Sullivan's Island, which is called Breach Inlet. Okay. It was actually an H.L. Henley Bridge named for the, for the Henley, because that's where they, they left out of. They all assumed it was between this area, that they okay. were on their way back. Well, it was Oceanside. It was Seaside wow. that, it, that it was actually located. Okay. And I think because of also, you know, we think it was covered up completely, probably early 1900s. Okay. So um, we had a lot of hurricanes around this region, um, you know, over a century ago. So I think but technology just came, and, and we're glad. If they would have found this, you know, 75 years ago, there would have been no way to raise her. So it was a sonar that actually found it? A magnetometer. Okay, mm -hmm. and were they looking for it, or were they just they were. looking? Clive Cussler, okay. who is a very famous author, adventure writer, um, he likes to find things. That's, that's his passion. And he had been looking for the Hunley for, for years, so it wasn't 
but it, probably 20 years later after he really started wow. looking for it is when he actually found it. And it's like looking for a needle in a haystack underwater. <laughs> so they'll have an anomaly. It's like a fish finder. Okay. Pop up. Well, it doesn't say what it is, so you have to go down, make sure it's not the Hunley, which 99% of the time it wasn't. It wasn't. So uh, Harry Peccarelli, who was a part of that NUMA dive team, that's what he said. Well, whatever it is, it's not the Hunley. Okay. Famous last words. Yeah. So he goes down to excavate that area, and they plot it so they don't come back again. And it was the Hunley. He felt wow. the conning tower. Because the wow. area he uncovered was right where the conning tower was. Okay. So and It how took about five years for them to come up with the plan to actually raise, raise the sub. And it was once they found it, they decided they were definitely going to raise it? Yes. Okay. And how deep of water was it in? About 28 feet. Okay. Depends on the tide. So not really not that deep. Not that deep. Um, and it was covered about three to four feet okay. of sand and silt. Wow. So was there, uh, with the raising, was there a lot of danger? Because it wasn't that deep, was there a lot of danger to the people raising it? Or is it more danger to the actual damaging the ship? I would say it was more dangerous to their blood pressure, the people in charge of raising it, than it was actual physical. Okay. Um, you know, science has caught up and they, the engineering was there and solid. So I think they were just worried that, you know, because in Charleston, everybody knows where they were that day. If you ask August 8th when the Hunley was raised, people are like, oh, I know where I was. And it's wow. just kind of a, a day in history for here. There were thousands of people that just literally stopped. Wow. Because they took it in through under the bridge, our big bridge out there, the Ravenel Bridge. And people, the bridge stopped. People got out and watched wow. as a barge brought, brought the Hunley in. Um, there were hundreds of boats, kayakers, four miles out, um, watching this being raised. So they're, uh, collectively were holding their breath when she broke the surface and until she wow. got on the barge. I mean, after how many years, that's, that's got to be exciting and scary and... All of the above. All of the above. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> so after they raised it, and what, what, uh, what year did they raise it? 2000. 2000. So after they raised it, where did it go? Uh, at the Warren Lash Conservation Center, which is where we're at right now. Okay. And this building was abandoned. This is part of the Navy base. Okay. And the Navy base went defunct in 95. Okay. So this was literally outfitted uh, for the conservation center and specifically for the Hunley project. And did they build that before they raised it? They did. Okay. Um, this building was just a shell. So they outfitted it probably about a year to two prior to okay. raising the vessel. That's awesome. And so you raised it, you brought, brought it here. What happened then? Our first thought was, and the first goal was actually to uh, excavate and get the human remains out. Okay. Um, above all, this was, you know, a war grave. And so we wanted to get the human remains out and then bury them in the proper burial that they deserved. So okay. that was the, the goal. And they actually started that process in the beginning of 2001. And then in 2004, actually today is a I think our anniversary for that. We buried. Really? I think it is. 17th. Wow. We buried him in April. Wow. So that might be a fortunate day. I mean, and they're also at the um, they're at Magnolia Cemetery, which is just down the street, and that's with the other two crews. So mm -hmm. there's a little Hunley section. Oh, so the other two crews are there as mm -hmm. well. Wow. Yeah. You excavate or you release the crew, you buried them, and then what happened with it? Basically, it's, it's getting everything else out of that. I mean, there was tons and tons and tons of sediment that was inside the vessel. And our mission has always been to, you know, razor, preserver, and then it'll be on display okay. for a full-time museum. This currently is in a temporary facility for us. Okay. Um, so it's is, not going to stay here? Correct. This okay. is part of Clemson University's Restoration Institute. Okay. So uh, the Hunley will leave, leave here, hopefully, in five or six years in a full-time museum, a maritime museum. Okay. So it won't just be Hunley, but she'll be, the obviously, the marquee artifact. Exactly. And, and, and then it'll free it up for the next thing that needs right. to be preserved. Whatever they want to do with that. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, could you talk a little bit about... And now you said this is because this is a prop and it was for a movie and, and you don't want to make actors have to like, <laughs> like contort themselves right. for hours and hours. Um, this is bigger, but could you talk about the design of this? Because even this big, it's intimidating. Yes. People look at this and cringe. 
and, and I said, well, this is roomy. <laughs> this is co big compared to the actual submarine. They had, they had the bench where seven of them would sit. So this, he actually had seats, which okay. we removed. We got tired of answering why are there seats. So we, we put a bench in there, and we actually think it was painted with white lead paint. Okay. The whole interior. Uh, senior conservator Paul Mardikian actually found traces of white lead paint wow. on the bench. And was that to make it a little bit brighter in there? Yeah, when... we believe so. Okay. That definitely would have helped because they have a candle, so that's really your only size, um, source for illumination, and they went out at 823 at night in February, so it's dark. Yeah. So um, what was also very innovative about the sub is they had, we call these deadlights like the little portholes. Okay. They had um, covers from the inside, so this Hunley can kind of go in stealth mode. Okay. So they would put those covers on, because if you're in the middle of the ocean, that's a beacon. I mean, you'll yeah. totally stick out. So, but they could, they were also had rubber gaskets, so they were leak proof. Wow. Um, so the, the white would have definitely helped. Okay. And then it was, they all grabbed onto these. The crank, the, the hand crank. The crank, and they, it was all hand cranked. Was, there's no engine. Wow, and what raised it and lowered it? Uh, Lieutenant Dixon, who would sit at the forward conning tower, he was the only one who could actually probably sit more upright. Okay. But to me, it'd be worse, because the conning tower, it, it's almost like Darth Vader's mask. I've, I've heard, I took that from somebody, but it's just very, it's almost more claustrophobic okay. to me. He didn't have any room. Um, but he had a joystick. Okay. And was able to raise and lift the dive planes. Okay. Also, we had two ballast tanks, forward and aft, that could you know have the water and balance that out. Uh, two pump systems okay. that could bilge water out, bring it in. This was quite advanced for the time. Absolutely. I mean, to have this, it was built in 1862, to have this knowledge, and, and it worked. And it worked. Uh, the two sinkings before that we talked about, it was human error. Okay. It wasn't anything by the design of, of the submarine. and. You know, the final, we don't know why, but it, I don't know that it was necessarily, um, you know, a flaw of the vessel either. Okay. Now, what sort of things did you find, artifacts did you find that you were excited about? Other than just finding this itself, I'm assuming there was a level of excitement once you were actually working on it. Right. I mean, to say, I mean, the first button, you like freak out. And then, it, you know, after like literally every day, you're like, okay, what else are we going to find? But, <laughs> Um, you know, some people, we have the display of, of the gold coin, the life-saving gold coin of Dixon, which is all shiny, um, and some jewelry, diamond and gold jewelry that he had on board. And what's the story of the gold coin? The gold coin is the, the legend that we actually heard of, you know, as we heard of the Hunley. Um, we heard the legend that was passed down that said Lieutenant Dixon was given a um, gold coin, $20 gold piece, uh, by his apparent sweetheart, Queenie Bennett, and he got, went to the Battle of Shiloh, and he got shot. And it became the lucky gold coin because where he got shot, he happened to have the gold coin in his pocket. Oh, wow. So it's deflected the, the mini ball, and you can actually tell on his femur where he got struck. Wow. And you can also tell on the mini ball, I mean, or the, uh, the coin, the traces of the lead mini ball. And it's okay. bent, like they said it was, but he had it inscribed, which we never heard. So that was pretty cool. Um, and what did it say? It said, uh, my life preserver. His initials, GED, April 6, 1862. Wow. Um, and Shiloh. So that's, that's like an, an extra little added information that nobody knew until you found it. Right. The E, would have, we don't know what his middle name is, and we don't know where he's from. Wow. That would have been helpful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm from. <laughs> would have been nice. Um, but those aren't very challenging to conserve. Why they look pretty, I mean, you literally clean them off and they're good to go. Okay. Um, I think some of the more personal, like um, Paul had mentioned earlier, his favorite is a match. So they would have had wood matches back then and just, you know, light the candle. So, you know, when you light a match, it has that burnt end. Yeah. He was able to find, they found the match and wow. they conserved the burnt end. Wow. So you imagine it was waterlogged, you know, in wow. all of this sediment for 136 years. I wouldn't imagine that wood would last that long. Yep. Wow. Um, you know, I like the oil can because they're personal items. Yeah. And it wasn't, there weren't a lot because you think about it, they had a mission and they were coming back. So yeah. I think that's also telling as people initially thought it was a suicide mission. Well, w uh, Wicks, which is one of our crew members, had four daughters. Oh, wow. He did not send a letter home before this mission. There was no, like, in case I don't make it back. Yeah. Um, nothing like that was left behind by any of the crew members. And because of what they took, they took something to go out and come back in. Yeah. So I think they had every 
thought that they were going to return wow. from their mission. I'm sure they also knew there was a, there's chance. a chance. Absolutely, but I mean, it wasn't it's saying there. two other times. So exactly, and it was dangerous. You know, it's at yeah. night, and it's you know. So I, I think they they obviously would have known that, but they weren't. That wasn't their top concern. Wow. Now. People know that or the story of the Huntley is written beforehand, you know, the, the building of it, and, and people knew that it was, they, there was a submarine. But was there anything surprising you found as you're excavating the site, as you're excavating inside, that wasn't public knowledge beforehand? The, the whole structure of the submarine, I mean, you know, we didn't, we don't have plans of exactly how it was constructed. So they, you know, we heard it was two crude boilers, you know, just kind of put together. Um, just getting into the sub was a challenge and was interesting. So the rivets, this is actually accurate, were instead of from the outside in, okay. which is like how the Titanic was, yeah. these were flush. So they went from the inside out and okay. then they flushed it off. Oh, so wow. So the skin of the Hunley would be smooth. Okay. Which would be important in the water, create the water. less draft. And, and then the... Uh well, the rivets might pop in, but they, it has less of a, of a opportunity to pop right. outwards. You know, we're constantly finding things that either prove or just <laughs> more likely disprove uh, theories. And the spar was initially what we thought um, is that it was attached to, actually we thought it was attached to the top of the submarine. Okay. And when we excavated back in 2000, they realized it was attached to the very bottom and out of iron. So that had to be removed prior to raising the Hunley. And the thought was that it had a spar torpedo attached to the very be you know, t front of it, and that would have black powder, 90 pounds, 100, you know, it varies. And it would ram into the hull of the ship. Yep. The submarine would back out. And okay. then we did find a lanyard, so somehow it would be triggered, and then it exploded. Right. When I say exploded, if you see Ted Turner's movie, you'll see a lovely Hollywood explosion. <laughs> that is not what happened that night. Okay. Um, it just went down. It perfectly hit where it should have. It went down in a matter of minutes. Wow. Um, the other ships that were in the harbor didn't even know that it went wow. down. So when they, when the, you know, Housatonic crew went out to get the lifeboats to go to the other ships, they were like, why are you here? So there's no... It wasn't major, loud. It was just no. under, boom, made a hole. Right. And, and as just... they approach, again, there was no submarine at that time, that, that word. They're like, what is that? Is it a porpoise? Is it a log? And by the time they figured it out, they couldn't get their cannons angled down that way. So it was like small arm fires that were able to... To wow. shoot at it. And because it's iron, it might have been protected at least some Well, and some that's one thing the... when, we, when we deconcrete, we'll see did it actually take any damage from any bullets. Um, but back to the spar, so we thought that's how they, and then when they deconcreted it last year, they realized there was copper sheathing at the very front of it. Okay. And that's how it would have attached the, the torpedo. So it was, and because of the, um, it kind of was pulled back so you could see it would have the copper would have pulled back from the implosion. Right. Um, we think it was more of a contact mine, and they were okay. a lot closer wow. to the hull of the Housatonic and the explosion than what we initially thought, which wow. obviously could play into Why the crew's sank. demise. Absolutely. What is deconcretion? The layer that covers the Hunley right now is a fancy word for the shells and just over a century of stuff that's stuck to the, to the front of the submarine. Okay. So we're going to deconcrete it, take all of that off. So it's been sitting in a tank of water, you know, 14 years. We'll put caustics inside of it okay. in the tank, so it'll help with that and with the salts. And then we'll start literally, you know, by hand taking all of that concretion off. And that's what you're planning on doing between now and when you next move year. it to okay oh, yeah. next. Okay. It'll it'll be a while. It'll be a while. <laughs> um, when the excavation was being done mm -hmm. with the silt. Was there anything that you learned, not necessarily about the Hunley, but about marine life in the area? I mean, that's uh, been buried for a long time. You said it was in seven or four, three to four foot of silt. Mm -hmm. Was there anything interesting you learned marine-wise? I've ever been asked that question. I don't have a great answer for it. I'm sure there is because they literally they would take box cores, and you can tell. With the sediment, we have a geologist that okay. consults. So there's tons of different sciences that are included in this project: metallurgy, um, forensics, anthropology, archaeology, conservation, um, geology. So the, there's definite layers of sediment, and okay. they're different colors. Um, so I honestly don't know what that, but it's <laughs> there was study done to it. Yes. Okay. So the future is you're going to deconcrete 
the outside. Mm -hmm. Are you going to do the inside as well, or does that not have as much? I think they're going to analyze first because okay. the, the hull plates are very thin. Okay. And in a lot of places, it is the concretion's a lot thicker than the actual. So it's to not to stabilize the sub, they, they'll take that in consideration. So okay. they won't, you know, the big thing is keeping the integrity of the sub, how it, right. how it originally was. Right. Um, everything that's been removed from the sub because of the caustics will be yeah. placed back into the sub. Okay. And it will be covered like it, it was. So it'll look like it oh, was. Oh, so like the, the can and... The artifacts will remain out. The artifacts but, remain out. Um, okay. But the a lot of the structural artifacts, like the whole plates, will be put back on. Oh, okay. Okay. So we'll, we want to keep the integrity, and we really tried to minimize any disassembly okay. as much as possible. Okay. Um, and then once that's done, you said it's about five years before you're going to move it. Mm -hmm. Is the rest of that period for study, or is um, it going to take that long to to clean it off. Well, once it's decreased, it has to sit in those, that solution because it's a salt. This okay. has been, you know, this iron has been literally infiltrated with salt for over a century and a half. Okay. So it's not stable. Um, so trying to remove the salt, um, there is a process called subcritical treatment, which was patented here with us in Clemson University. Okay. Um, which some of our artifacts have actually been preserved and conserved by. And it's basically the same process the caustics, but you heat it up in a reactor. Huh. So it completely speeds that up to where it might take, this would take years. Right. In traditional method, it could take six months. Wow. So we just need a big tank. Okay. And, that, and we're actually, you know, hoping to move forward. And if that's the case, it'll be done a lot quicker. A lot quicker. But we have a lot of other artifacts, the textiles that still need to be conserved. Um, so there's, you know, it's, it's not like you raise and then it's done. It's a, right. it's a long, it's, it's a long process. Well, if it's five years, that's almost twenty years since it's been raised. Yes. Wow. Thank you for reminding me. Of that. I'm sorry. <laughs> yes. <Yeah, that's laughs> um, now, when it's on, when it when it moves and it's on display, mm -hmm. are you going to have any sort of like cameras on the inside, like underwater cameras, so people? Because you say you're closing it back up. So that people who go to view it from the outside, can, are they going to be able to see on the inside as well? I'm not sure what the final display will look like. Okay. Depending on the stability of the sub at that time, it might be in an argon gas container. It would be environmentally controlled, whether right. it's water, whether it's argon gas, we're not sure. Um, and we just haven't really, it's so far away still, we haven't really surrounded how we're going to display it um, okay. and for, it'll be clear that I will tell you okay be able to walk around completely yes uh, but they'll do complete you know cutaways okay exact replicas of how you know really you know kind of getting an experience we're actually here at, at our area we're going through an exhibit overhaul so okay. in the next by the end of this year we're gonna completely update this entire area okay so we wanted people to get an experience of what it would be like right to be in it and I think that's the big you know, message we're trying to, you know, what it was like to be in the, inside that. Now, you're not, you're, you're um, preserving the Hunley, mm -hmm. but you're not going to do any restoration. You're going to keep it how it is with the holes. You're not going to, like, paint it or anything. No. You're just preserving it how right. it is now. Right. Minus everything that's, right. yeah. <laughs> right. Um, and... It's at Charleston because it sank at Charleston, right? Correct. The Navy okay. actually owns the Hunley. Okay. And the Navy gave it to the state of, state of South Carolina in perpetuity. So the Hunley Commission, which is a state agency, actually uh, manages and directs the project. Okay. Um, so the Navy has overall rights, but because of where it was located off okay. Charleston waters, um, it was built in Mobile. So initially, from what I'm told, Mobile obviously had a lot of interest in getting the Hunley back. So right. I think there was a mini civil war that might have <laughs> occurred between some southern states to get the Hunley, but um, the Navy gave it to the state of South Carolina. Now, when we got to actually see the Hunley today, they were working on it. The tank was drained. What were they actually doing? You actually got a special treat because the average visitor who comes on the weekend, which is unfortunately when we're only available for tours, um, they don't get to see them working on the submarine. So the tank was drained, which is a much better view. I wish we could have it that way all the time. And they were actually surveying the the vessel. Um, they've done that before, but okay. you know, with technology now, we, so they can manipulate. They can put it all on a computer and scan it, and they can manipulate it via computer 
otherwise manipulating a seven ton sub. Right. So it's a way for them to do projections. Can't you know? Um, we're going to be doing a study in terms of the black powder and okay. how close it was. Do an analysis of how much of an impact would that have had. Right. So they're getting all that information to be able to put into to things like that to be able to determine you know cause and effect. Okay. How did they breathe in here when they were underwater? Was it just whatever air was in and then they went down and had to hope they were going to be fine until the mission was over? Or was there a way of replenishing? Yes. Okay. Um, they actually did a test mission. So about a little over two hours, they could be completely submerged okay. and, you know, be okay. Uh, they had two ways of basically, you know, recycling the air. They had a snorkel box, which had two snorkel tubes, okay. which I think you saw. And, but they're not very tall. Yeah. I mean, you saw how small they were. Yeah, they were only like about... Three, maybe, uh, yeah, right. Yeah. Um, and they had a bellow system. So they could completely, you know, bring in the oxygen and replenish... Um, and circulate the air basically, which okay. again, 1862. That's um, amazing. Right. Yeah. And then the best way was for them to go to the surface, open up the two conning towers, and then you get more amount of air. Okay. Problem with that is if it was choppy outside, you know, on the, on the ocean, then they could have easily taken in water and gotten swamped. Okay. So the, that was the safe way to yeah. do it. And the candle was also useful for that. Um, the candle? The, there was a candle that okay. would illuminate, but also it was kind of like the canary in the mines. Okay. So if it in, went out on its own accord, they knew their oxygen level was, was depleting. Pretty low. Wow. That's, I can't even imagine. Uh, and that's what we, that's, that's probably a leading theory as to what happened to them is, is that, lack of oxygen. Okay. Because how the bodies were found um, was very telling. Okay. Initially when they started to get to that, you know, when they were excavating, um, the initial thought was those two points of exit, you're going to find all the commingling in these human remains. Right. Which, if that makes sense. Yeah. Like trying if, to get out. Yeah. Um, and that's what you didn't see. Really? They were literally boom, boom, boom. Like they were? All in a row. Okay. We've, at their, we call them their stations. Obviously, it's cramped quarters. They're crammed in there anyway. Right. But if you, you know, it's a theory called fight or flight. Okay. It's neurological. You, you're going to try to get out of there. Yeah. And there's not eight guys that are going to sit there and go, okay. I accept We're this. done. Yeah. yeah. Maybe two of them, but not, <laughs> you know, and you're going to try to fight and do whatever you can to get out of there. Um, and with th three getting out the first time, it can be done. Okay. So, I, you know, it either happened so quickly they couldn't react. Right. Or anoxia is a leading theory that they just. Okay. You know, and, the, and with anoxia, you're not thinking clearly, from what I'm told. So you could think, I've, well, we've only been down here 20 minutes, and it We're might fine. be an hour and a half. Yeah. And if your candle went out, your matches are wet, you can't see anything. You know, yeah. we know they probably wanted to wait after they accomplished their mission because the tide, wait for the tide to go in. There's right. no way they could have gone against the tide. Okay. They would have been physically exhausted. Right. Um, a lot of carbon dioxide would have been expelled. Um, okay. You know, was there any damage to the vessel from the spar? And that's, you'll learn, you'll po hopefully, hopefully learn. Hopefully learn, right. And that's what's, you know, we may not ever know 100% what happened to the Hunley. My wish and I think our goal is that we would have a couple really strong theories okay. as to what if, which I think that's pretty interesting as well. Yeah. Because it still engages people. We get letters all the time or emails from, you know, kids. This is why the Hunley sink. <laughs> I think it's great. Yeah. You know, it engages people and they talk about it. So it, anything that gets people talking about history is there's nothing wrong with that. No, that's a wonderful thing. Um, when you were when they were studying the remains, and I'm mm -hmm. assuming after the remains were taken out mm -hmm. that they were studied. Mm -hmm. Uh, did they find any telling marks on that? Like, I can imagine that if the black powder went off close and they had some sort of problem where they, I don't know if they would all hit their heads, but, you know, some sort of pressure change or something that could cause them to just go, Voof, that that would have been shown in the remains. Was there any sort of telling signs that they were able to find? No. No. Um, so the bodies were just... That, and that's a good question, because one of the early theories was that Lieutenant Dixon was shot in the head. Um, there's a hole in the forward conning tower, okay. and we assume somebody got a lucky shot off. Yeah. Because the glass is gone. Well, his cranium is still intact. There's no markings okay. on anybody besides his leg. Um, yeah. His, somebody's rotator cuff is, you know, little things like that nose is broken. They can tell um, okay. the skull but nothing that shows any kind of impact okay. in terms of that. We don't have tissue 
Okay. Um, well, it's, yeah. But the but the remains themselves were in pristine condition. Okay. And um, what they can tell is the anthropologist from the Smithsonian was able to determine out of all eight, four are from the states and four of European descent. Oh and wow. And he could tell with the Europeans who had been in the states longer. Okay. Because of the bone density and because of our diet, uh, the Europeans were more wheat, okay. and uh, the states were more corn fed. So it changed the bone density, so he could tell, you know, he could the height, the the rough, you know, weight, age, you know, roughly all those personal details that we don't know. So, you don't actually know who all the crew members are. Correct. That was a, a mystery. It is. Um, Miller is the one crew member we don't have a first, or you know, we're hoping it's Miller. We have put a question mark because we're not we're not wow. positive. Um, you know, we have three just three of the crew members we have descendants from. Okay. So that's been helpful. Um, we don't have a picture of anybody. So the facial reconstructions are really what we're going on right now, and that was based on um, the anthropologist and the skull, and then he worked with the forensic artist um, wow. in creating what we think so is a, close. So a lot of people, are, over half a dozen people died, and you don't actually know no. who they all are. Wow. Um, is there any ongoing archaeology or at the actual site where this sank to see if there was any other I, artifacts telling signs uh, that tell the story more? Or um, did they just do it when they were down there and then they're done now? They did go back out after it was raised. There was a grappling hook. Okay. That was, because um, the exact coordinates have never been released. Okay. So they went out to get a grappling hook that they found. Um, but nothing else, like the, the snorkel tubes, a rudder, and one of the cut waters was not attached. Okay. But it was right there at the site. Okay. Probably over time it just, it just fell. But there's parts of the Housatonic that are still out there. Okay. And when they were studying the Housatonic's site, did they find anything from this that was a, a sign at all? No, because back then, they, you know, they imploded the, the hull to try to clear a path for other ships. So they destroyed so any, of any the, sort right, of... Any, any sort of evidence, you know, probably was long gone. Marine archaeology is, is a new science to the States. So actually, most of our staff initially, n not one of them was from the States. Okay. Because the United States is a young country. So Texas A&M probably has the most um, credible marine archaeology, you know, uh, study here. But most of them are French, um, Uruguay, Chile, Denmark. Like, nobody's from here. So this is an international effort. Absolutely. Wow. We did a symposium to try to get the best of the best and, you know, how you're going to, nobody's ever done this before. So yeah. all our, our conservator, he is on the, he's worked on the Titanic. He's worked on the Alabama. Wow. Um, you know, and it's the innovation of the Hunley in the 1860s and then the innovation of what we've been able to do now. So that's why I said, I'm glad we didn't find it 75 years ago. Yeah. Never would have had the technology to raise it properly and never would have had the technology to do what we're doing now. So like with the human remains, we pulled samples from everything you can think of. So maybe 20 years from now, maybe I'm, we're, you know, we're all yeah. long gone and some distant family member, boom, you're able wow. to identify. So we've done all this for what may happen. Okay. Um, with the archaeology, it's not just, I mean, it can be very medial of this, you know, scraping of, of that and then sifting through it. Um, you know, there's that, but it's also a lot of computer science, a lot of software that's done, um, a lot of scanning. Again, to manipulate a scan is a lot easier than manipulating a fragile artifact or right. manipulating a huge sub that you can't lift. Um, you know, metallurgy, a study of the metals. It's just, it's all these different sciences. So, you know, the project has a lot of interest for a lot of different reasons. I get asked all the time, you know, what's your, who comes here? Yeah. And I can't put a finger on, oh, this person. It's not just the historians. It's not just people that like Southern history. It is um, maritime history. It is science. A lot of German interest is in this sub because it looks a lot like the German U-boats. Wow. If you look at the design. Yeah. Very resonant, uh, remnant of that. So it's, you know, it's different things to different people. And there's also the human element. That these eight people got in here and lost their lives lost. for what they believe they were doing. Wow. And that's kind of interesting concept that as technology moves into the future, we're able to better see our past. Absolutely. Ooh, I might steal that. That's really good. But also, it can, you know, I swear sometimes, like, another scan. I'm like, there's always a new scanner coming out. <laughs> Stop scanning. Or, you know, you, you can always do too much. Right. You know? um, but it's, you know, with the, with the x-rays, too, what they're able to do and how, you know, we've never been able to do that 
years ago. It's, it's incredible, and it's incredible shape for being out of the water, well, being raised mm -hmm. for 14 years. I, it's, you, the, pre, the preservation is just incredible. And, and hopefully that will go on in the future and be able to just last for an extreme long time. Right. And the goal is also to preserve all the artifacts as much as possible. Um, you know, we went to the lab and that's where most of the artifacts are being conserved. Um, we talked about the technology. Some of that is and then some of it's really not. It is water picks, picks, dental light. You know, it really is a pain. They have so much patience. Wow. That I could never have. But dealing with textiles, I mean, that's the most, it's waterlogged. Yeah. And you have to be really, really, I mean, they're just remnants. We don't have a uniform. Right. Um, you know, that was probably the worst artifacts that were, you know, they were badly decomposed at that time. But you still did find some. We have remnants. So remnants. they're able to, like a vest. Um, and there's different textiles. Textile. There's silk, cotton, um, wool. Obviously, wool is hardier fiber. The, the leather boots or the leather shoes did very well. Right. Um, a, silk, a silk kerchief. Okay. Um, so just different, but not, you couldn't look at that and go, oh, that's a jacket. Right. It's just oh, yeah. something. Pieces, yes. <laughs> Pieces. Wow. Thank you very much for talking with us today. And this is, location is slightly off the beaten path, but it's amazing that you are opening it up to the public on weekends to be able to actually see the process as it goes along. It was either be able to do on the weekends or not see it at all. So we figured this is the best the best uh, scenario. So lots of people can find it. It is, you're right, it's off the beaten path. And um, But it's definitely, in my opinion, worth coming out and seeing. We're glad to have you out here today. Thank you very much. You're